Hello, halfway parents and students. I'm going to be reading chapter four of Cryptid Hunters. My name is Mr. Kobercheck, and I am the school's resource teacher. Tighten your seatbelts. Phil Bishop pushed the nose of the seaplane down through the thick clouds, and the twins found themselves above a large expanse of blue-gray water. There, Marty pointed, in the distance was a fur-covered island shrouded in mist. You don't suppose Uncle Travis has the island all to himself? Grace ignored the question. She leaned forward and tapped Bertha on the shoulder. There's somebody in a small kayak down there. What are you talking about, dear? A kayak. It's red. Bertha looked over at Phil, and they both scanned the surface of the water through the windshield. I don't see a thing, Bertha said. I don't see anything either, Phil added. No one owns a kayak on the island, and it's more than a hundred miles from the nearest landfall. No kayaker in his right mind would be that far from shore. If Grace says there's a kayak, Marty said, there's a kayak. Grace had eyes like an eagle. Bertha looked at Phil. If she's right, the kayaker is in big trouble. It wouldn't hurt to look. Phil sighed dipped the left wing, and started circling. A few minutes later, Bertha pointed and said, I see it. Grace was right. Phil looked, then said something that would have gotten him expelled from the Omega Opportunity Preparatory School. He spoke into the microphone on his headset. The twins could not hear what he was saying, but they assumed he was calling for assistance. Five minutes later, they were skimming the relatively smooth water of the island's sheltered bay. As they taxied toward shore, they passed a concrete dock with a large rusty ship moored to it. The ship was called the Colacanth. Maybe they'll use the Colacanth to rescue the kayaker, Marty said, pronouncing the name co il canth Grace shook her head. It's pronounced Silacanth. I knew that, Marty said, his usual response to something he did not know. What's a colacanth? I think it's a fish, Grace answered. But they won't be using the ship to rescue anyone. It doesn't look seaworthy, and it's too big. But they could see that, Marty pointed to the helicopter sitting on the forward deck. I suppose they could, Grace agreed. But the helicopter didn't look much better than the ship it was on. Phil docked the seaplane, then climbed out and began tying it down. When it was secured, Bertha jumped out of the cockpit and the twins clambered out after her. What about the kayaker? Marty asked. Don't worry, we'll get him, Phil answered, then turned to Bertha. Why don't you run them up to the fort? We can bring the luggage and groceries up later. Fort, Marty asked. You'll see. Bertha led them to a gravel lot above the deck, above the dock, where a lone vehicle was parked. Wow, Marty said. It's a Humvee. The blocky four-wheel drive was painted in desert camouflage and looked like it had been rolled, in a t rolled a time or two. He ran ahead and gave it a quick going over. When Bertha and Grace joined him, he pointed at a line of large holes across the driver's door. What are these? Bullet holes? Bertha said. 50, cha 50 caliber. No kidding. We have several Humvees on the island, Bertha explained. Your uncle got them from the army. They're not much to look at, but once you get them started, they'll go just about anywhere. A lot of our equipment is military surplus. Maybe Woof is one of those paramilitary, paranoid wacko types, Grace whispered. Have you ever thought of that? You're the one that's paranoid, Marty answered. You think so? She pointed to a huge sign at the front of the parking lot with three-foot-tall red letters. No trespassing, electronic surveillance, trespassers will be shot. That does seem a bit extreme, Marty admitted. What's that, dear? Bertha asked. I was just wondering about the sign, he said. We're very, we're very, we're very security conscious here. Why? 
There are things on the island that Bertha hesitated. Well, your uncle will explain everything when you see him. Is there a town on the island? Marty asked. Heavens no, Bertha said. This is your uncle's island. The whole thing? The whole shebang, Bertha got into the front seat of the Humvee. Marty looked at Grace. I guess your theory about him wanting our inheritance is down the tubes. Owning an island doesn't mean he's not hurting for money. And what about my para, my paramilitary wacko theory? What about the fort? You'll look great in camouflage fatigues, Marty said, and climbed into the front seat next to Bertha. Grace got in the back. The veteran Humvee coughed and shook, but finally came to a roaring start. Before Bertha engaged the clutch, she reached the glove box. She reached the glove box and pulled out two silver chains with square pieces of colored plastic hanging on them. She she gave the blue one to Grace and the gray one to Marty. What are these? Grace asked. Identification. Bertha pulled out a green tag from the neck of her dress. We all wear them here. The twins looked at the tags. They were blank on both sides. I don't understand, Marty said. Let me guess, Grace said. Uncle Travis will explain it to us when we see him. That's right. Just put them on for now and don't take them off. That's one of the rules of the island. What are some of the other rules, Marty asked. Don't wander around the island unless one of us is with you, at least for the time being. If you think you shouldn't be doing something, ask before you do it. Never complain about my cooking. Have fun. And, well, I'm sure we'll come up with some more rules as time passes. We've never had children here before. She stepped on the gas, sending up a spray of gravel. The twins weren't able to see much on the way up to their uncle's house because Bertha drove the Humvee as if she were trying to outrun a forest fire. The narrow, winding road was a blur of green trees. They crossed a bridge and took a hard right onto another road, which led them up a steep hill. At the top, Bertha brought the Humvee to a skidding stop in front of a three-story house made of moss-covered stone blocks. Parked in front of the house was another Humvee, identical to the one they were in, without the bullet holes. Your uncle's inside, Bertha said. I'm going back down to give Phil a hand. The twins got out and Bertha drove away as fast as she arrived. Grace and Marty stood very quietly for a moment and took in their surroundings. It needs a good pressure washing, Marty, Marty said, or a stonemason, but it does look like a fort. More like a haunted castle, Grace said, knowing about the only thing that spooked her brother was ghosts. I have a very bad feeling about all of this. I bet it's filled with zombies and ghouls. Marty did his best to ignore her. He did not want to think about ghosts and haunted castles. The house sat on a promon promonatory. Strong winds and salt air had worn away the stonework. To the west was a sheer cliff and an endless span of water with drifting patches of fog above it. Boy... Would I love to hang, hang glide off that, he said. To the east was a thick forest of trees. On the far side of the island was a massive hill covered with several white spinning windmills. What do you suppose those are for, he asked. Wind turbines, Grace answered, to generate electricity. I knew that, Marty said, and turned his attention back to the house. There were dozens of windows with stone balconies. The slate roof was covered with antennas and several satellite dishes of different sizes. He must get every TV station on Earth, Marty said. At the boarding school, they had not been allowed to watch much television. And when they did, they could only watch shows that Dr. Beazle had previewed and approved. The front door is wide open, Grace said, but there's nobody here to greet us. Don't you think that's a little strange, Marty? Marty did. Marty did think it was a little bit odd. But before he could respond, 
A very large raven flew through the front door and headed right toward them. Watch out! He tackled Grace and tried to cover her as best he could. The bird veered away from them at the, very, at the last second. It circled the house twice, gaining altitude with each loop, then flipped out to sea, making a deep, qu deep corking sound like a crow with a bad cold. Sorry about that, Marty helped Grace up, a little embarrassed at his overreaction. I thought the bird was going to. No, no, it, it's perfectly all right, Grace interrupted him. Her brother's <clears throat> gallantry and quick wits were two of his best traits, and she wouldn't think of criticizing either, even though he had knocked her down and she had scraped her knee. Now that was strange, Marty said. Why would Uncle Travis have a raven in his house? Maybe it was feeding on a corpse, Grace said, brushing herself off. Marty shuddered, then walked up onto the porch and knocked on the door jam. Uncle Travis? It's Marty and Grace. There was no response. Now what? Grace asked. I guess we go in. Hesitantly, they walked through the doorway and found themselves in a large entry hall. To the right was a wide staircase, to the left a closed set of doors, and directly in front of them a dark, long, a long dark hallway. Woo, Marty said. Smells a little musty in here, like a dungeon, Grace said. Look, in the corner was a pile of duffel bags and backpacks. Off to the side was a roll of mosquito netting coils of climbing rope, and soiled clothing. Looks like Uncle Travis just got back, Marty said. Grace held up a vest. The bottom of it almost touched the floor, and he's a giant. Marty picked up a huge cotton glove with holes in it. Fee, fi, fo, fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. You're not funny. Come on. He walked down the hallway, which led to an enormous dining room with a table that was at least 20 feet long. Looks like we're having newsprint for dinner, he said. Stacked on top of the table were pile after pile of old yellowed newspapers. Grace started going through them. Most of these are trashy supermarket papers. I guess he likes to keep on top of current events, Marty said. Grace picked one up and read the headline. Vampire sucks small Texas town dry. See what I mean? I'm getting scared, Marty. Marty was feeling a little nervous himself, but he wasn't about to admit it. He led Grace into the next room. Whoa, he said. Now this is what I call a kitchen. There was an ancient oven, an enormous grill, a walk-in freezer, a commercial refrigerator, a huge butcher block that looked like a thousand cows had been carved up on it, and dozens of iron skillets, and pans dangling from the ceiling. It was a far cry from the modern kitchen at school, but with a good cleaning and some organization, Marty thought it would do nicely. They walked through a swinging door and found themselves in a living room that ran the entire length of the house. Floor to ceiling, windows jutted out behind the cliff edge. Grace looked out at the thick fog. It feels as if you're floating above the ocean here, she said. Look, there's the kayak, Marty pointed to a red dot still some distance from shore, and the helicopter. It swooped in and hovered over the small boat. The kayaker is lucky you saw him. He'd be shark bait by now. They watched until a, a curtain of fog blocked their view. Marty wandered away from the window and started looking around the room. It was filled with mismatched but comfortable-looking chairs and sofas. The floor was covered with a threadbare oriental carpet. Hanging on the walls were old oil paintings, which Marty found particularly interesting. Assorted tribal masks, shields, spears, swords... <clears throat> and several stone gargoyles taken from old buildings. <coughs> Standing next to the fireplace was a full suit of armor that looked as though it had been pushed off a cliff. 
I guess Uncle Travis is an antique collector, Marty said. Or he spends his weekends at garage sales. On an island, Marty walked over to the plasma screen television on the far side of the room. The screen was covered with thick dust. Do you really think Mom and Dad intended for us to live on an island in the middle of nowhere with a man we've never met before? Grace asked. Marty wrote his name on the dust on the screen. It's not that bad, Grace. It just needs a good cleaning. You missed my point. What else is new? Come on. Grace followed him back to the entry hall, upstairs or through the double doors. The doors. Marty pushed them open, and they were hit with a blast of warm, mildewed air. The warmth came a, the warmth came from a blazing fireplace at the far end of an immense room. The mildew smell came from above. Circling the room was a balcony lined with books. A spiral staircase to the left of the door led up to it. I guess you didn't have to bring those books after all, Marty commented, running along the wall to the right of the room. was a laboratory bench covered with beakers, Bunsen burners, test tubes, a microscope, a magnifying light, and other paraphernalia. Perhaps Uncle Travis is a mad scientist. Marty did his best impression of Frankenstein's monster. Grace was not amused. You're as frightened as I am, she said. You always joke around when you're scared. Oh, please, Marty said, but he knew she was right. He walked over to the stone fireplace, which was big enough to do jumping jacks in. On either side of it were large aquariums. In one, in one were two of the ugliest fish he had ever seen. They were about four feet long and were covered with large metallic blue scales that looked like armor plating. What are they? Grace wandered over behind him. I'm not sure. Well, that's a first. Marty moved over to the second aquarium. Even I know what these are. Grace joined him and watched the ten-legged creatures darting around the artificial reef. What kind of person would keep a school of squid in his library? Her question was answered by a high-pitched barking. A moment later, a tiny black dog dashed into the room. It tried to stop when it reached them but slipped on the slick floor and slid ten feet past where they were standing. A pink identification tag hung from its tiny collar. What is it? Marty asked. A dog, you dunce. It sounds like a dog, but it looks like a curly black squirrel without a tail. Welcome to Kryptos Island, a deep voice boomed behind them. Grace and Marty jumped then looked in the direction of the voice and saw a large man framed in the doorway, leaning on a cane. He had long, black, unkept hair and a bushy black beard. Marty whispered to Grace, That's the kind of man who keeps squid in his library? He is a pirate, Grace thought, just as Bertha said. The only thing missing is a black eye patch and a bloody cutlass. She felt herself go faint and put a hand on Marty's shoulder. You okay? Marty asked. I'm not sure, she answered weakly. Stay close. The man walked over to him. His eyes were, sa were the same shade of brown as their mother's, but there was something wild and unsettling about them. He was dressed in baggy cargo pants, slippers, and a thick black sweater. Around his neck, he wore a tag like the ones Bertha had given him. But he was tur but his was turquoise. Uncle Travis? Marty asked. The man nodded, but please call me Woof. Everyone does. The tiny dog started running circles around the group, yapping frantically. <clears throat> Stop that nonsense, PD. The dog obediently sat down in front of him panting with a tongue no bigger than a pinky finger. You'd better get used to these kids. They've come to live with us. He held his cargo pocket open and said, Snake! To the twins' amazement, the dog jumped into his pocket, then poked its head out for one last defiant yap before disappearing. I'm sorry for all the confusion. 
Wolf apologized. Bertha and Phil probably already told you, but I just got back, and I wasn't able to get things ready for the way I wanted. And now we have this kayaker problem. Did you get him? Marty asked. Yes. Good, Marty pointed at his uncle's pocket. What kind of dog is he? It's a teacup poodle, and it's a she, not a he. Petey is an odd name. Hearing her name, the dog poked her head back out of the pocket and gave another yap. Short for pocket dog, Wolf explained. We were in the desert looking around one day, and she ran into a rattlesnake. There was no place to hide, so she hoped, she hopped into my pocket. She's been doing it ever since. All you have to say is snake? That's right. Let's get some more light in here. He turned on a lamp next to the sofa. When he turned back to, a, to them, a look of astonishment crossed his rugged face. What is it? Grace asked. Wolf closed his eyes for a moment, then opened them and stammered. Nothing. I'm, I guess I'm more tired than I thought. We just flew in this morning and I've been... There you are! Bertha came into the library with her arms full of groceries. She set the bags down and walked over to Wolf. Sorry to interrupt, but Phil needs to talk to you right away. Of course. I'll see you both at dinner, Wolf said, hurriedly, obviously relieved at the interruption. In the meantime, Bertha showed... Bertha will show you to your room so you can get some rest. You must be tired after your long flight. He rushed out of the room with Petey still in his pocket. Bertha picked up the bags and she said she would show them their rooms after she put the groceries in the kitchen. Marty started to follow her, but Grace held him back. What was that about? She said. Did you see the way Uncle Trav... I mean, Wolf looked at me? I thought he was looking at me. Marty said. He wasn't, and he sure seemed to get over his exhaustion r quickly. He didn't just leave the library. He fled from it. Marty shrugged his shoulders. <clears throat> it must have been an emergency. Wasn't the pocket dog great? Grace was more interested in pursuing their uncle's peculiar behavior. <clears throat> Don't change the subject. I'm not, Marty said. By the way, what does cryptos mean? I think it comes from the Greek, Greek word cryptos. Bertha came back in. Are you ready? Sure, Marty said. Grace caught him by the sleeve. The word means hidden, she whispered. <laughs>